Thanks for taking time to listen to this episode of The Real Rescue Podcast. Take a minute to go to therealrescue.com to check out these and other great deals from our sponsors here at The Real Rescue. This episode of The Real Rescue Podcast is brought to you by Breeze Eastern, the world's only dedicated helicopter hoist and winch provider. SR3 Rescue Concepts, because you don't know what you don't know. And rescueswimmershop.com, official high quality apparel featuring the silhouette. Breeze Eastern, they dedicate themselves to our helicopter rescue world. Since the very first helicopter rescue in November of 1945, Breeze Eastern has designed and manufactured superior rescue hoist solutions. While much of the technology and the unique mission requirements have changed over the past 75 years, their commitment to the rescuers, the operators, and those being rescued has not. Contact them today by visiting them at breeze-eastern.com. SR3 Rescue Concepts is a training company that can help your helicopter training. They train daytime, nighttime, aerial firefighting, hoist, longline, fast rope, rappel, and more. They can assist your program with standardization and safety checks or just an FAA annual refresher. With the certified flight instructor pilots and experienced crew, they are ready to help your agency keep up to date with current techniques, rules, regulations, and equipment. Plus, right now, SR3 is offering 10% off anything in their web store with the promo code, all capital letters, Real Rescue, R E A L R E S Q. Plus, they are offering 10% from their partners, Petzl and their equipment, all you got to do is send an email to info at sr3rescueconcepts.com. Mention this podcast, The Real Rescue Podcast, and they'll take care of the rest. 15 years ago, photographer and Coast Guard rescue swimmer number 526, Chris Razor, created an iconic photograph. This photograph depicted the silhouette of a helicopter rescue swimmer reaching down for an outstretched hand in need against the American flag backdrop. The image went viral and became a symbol worldwide for the rescue community and the people they help. Its wild popularity inspired Chris to launch RescueSwimmerShop.com, a web store offering official high quality apparel featuring his evocative image, The Silhouette. T-shirts, hats, patches, and stickers featuring the silhouette are available at RescueSwimmerShop.com, including the flagship design, So Others May Live. Follow Chris and his story on Instagram with the handle at RescueSwimmerShop. And if you are a rescue swimmer, support rescue swimmers, or just tell people you are one at the bar, this gear is definitely for you. When you get to the website, rescueswimmershop.com, enter the promo code, all lowercase, one word, rescue, R-E-S-C-U-E, for 10% off your order. I'm psyched to have on our next guest. He was my senior chief at my first rescue swimmer unit in Kodiak, Alaska. In this episode, he actually shares stories that I had never even really heard. Like we had talked about a little bit in the shop, but to get the full story here now, I'm totally pumped. So please welcome our next guest, United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 126, Mr. Olaf Lavelle. My name is Jason Quinn. I am United States Coast Guard Rescue Swimmer number 500. These are my rescues and rescues from those of us that put our lives on the line every day so others may live. This is The Real Rescue Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to The Real Rescue Podcast. Today I've got with me uh, just an amazing guy. I can't say enough good things about him. (laughs) He was my original, well, my first, I guess, Senior Chief in Kodiak, Alaska, United States Coast Guard, rescue swimmer number 126, Mr. Olaf Lavelle. What's up, Mr. Olaf? <laughs> What's going on, dude? What's 
Dude. Go ahead, Jason. Great to be here, man. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, all right. One so, of our shared dude, stories. I, you know what? I, I got to start that with that story because uh, so I was a boot rookie swimmer just in the shop. And there was a lot of things I remember about you specifically. Um, one of them, I remember walking into the shop with all my stuff and, and you looked at me like, who are you? And I'm like, I'm the new guy. And you're like, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and then we're at the Christmas party and I was like, oh, dude. And you were like, did you just really call me dude? Your senior chief, you called it dude. And I was like, oh. <laughs> do, do you remember, do you remember out at the, when we were handing stuff at the pool and, uh, and this is going to get a little bit vulgar, but this, this is actually when you stopped was, um, remember we had the big suburban yep. and we were coming back from one of our, one of our famous Kodiak pool days oh, God, and God. we were handing our gear out and I was out there, I was handing gear and you came out and you grabbed a couple bags. You go, Hey, thanks dude. And I just threw the bag down and, and, uh, chief Cavallo was standing right there and I go, we're best friends, Jason. I guess you want to go home and fuck my wife. I said that we're that good of friends. <laughs> And you just like stopped. You got that deer in the headlights. And you, not not one time after that did you ever call me dude. George was like, dude, that was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My bad. Okay. My bad. No, nah, that's all good. Man. It was funny as shit. <laughs> oh, my time. God. Oh. Well, all right. So for everybody else that doesn't know you, especially the way I do, because like I said, I mean, you and I were together <laughs> for basically uh, about – well, three, two, two years, two solid yeah, three, years. In two, two and a half years, probably. Yep. Yeah. Um, yep. Introduce yourself to everybody else. Kind of tell everybody who you are, where you're from, a little background, and how you got into oh. the Coast Guard. Okay. My name is uh, Olaf Lavelle. I, uh, I was born in the lovely, bustling town of Compton, California. Compton, Compton. West Side. Compton in the house. And I was raised, I was raised throughout Los Angeles and Southern California, around a lot of vatos and things like that. In fact, that's how I met my wife was I was supposed to go fight a crip at her high school and she was there to watch the fight. Thank God he didn't show up because it's not cool trying to get your ass beat when uh, trying to pick up on a girl. But I, <laughs> I, she was actually the reason, cause I was trying to be all gangster and I wasn't really going anywhere with my life. And she was like, dude, I'm not even going to date you until you get your, get your shit together. Yeah. So I, uh, Smart girl. I went to the uh, went to the huh? Smart girl. What? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. She's great. I'm still married to her, so yeah, she's a great girl. Yes. I uh, I uh, so I went down to the recruiter because I knew that was about the only thing I could do. And I didn't have a high school diploma. I didn't have a GED. To have I had a little, you know, I know it's surprising. I had a little bit of a criminal record, and I went in and I was gonna and I wanted to be a frog man with the Navy, but the Navy guy wasn't there. He was the only recruiter wasn't there, which. In hindsight, I probably should have went with that service because they weren't around. <laughs> he was out doing his own thing. But the army guy, he's like, hey, man, we'll, uh, you know, let me show you this videotape. Let me show you that. And, and then he's like, hey, we'll get you your GED. And then uh, he asked me, he goes, you know, what about, what, you know, you want to be airborne? I'm like, I don't even know what that is. And he showed me this, this videotape of these guys jumping out of an airplane. And he goes, and it's an extra $83 a month. So now I know how much my life is worth. It's 83 bucks a month. <laughs> that's why that's why I was account for that. So anyway, it looks amazing on paper. Honest, you're like, oh, I get to make an extra 83 oh, bucks a month. Seven, and I was 17 at the time. So I was like, oh man, that's righteous bucks, man. I'm like, right on. I'll live forever on 83 bucks. Um, so stupid. Uh, but and I wasn't a good soldier. I wasn't, you know, I did all my stuff. Um, but I I I wound up getting out and I was doing a a, a roofing job. In, in, in the summertime of Southern California, hot as hell. And I was, I came home, I was drinking a beer in front of the, uh, the, uh, the TV one time watching some late night movie. And I watched this old commercial with Lou Gossett Jr. With the Coast Guard and these little, the, the 41s with M60s on them. Next day I called the recruiter and he's like, do you know what you want to do in the Coast Guard? I go, yeah, man, I want to be a, a, a 60 gunner on one of those little small white boats. He kind of chuckled. He's like, yeah, you need to come down here. So I went down there and I, I didn't realize because in the army, like everything has a job, like everything is a position, you know, and the Coast Guard only had, I think it was like 20, 23, 25 jobs at the time. And there was this one job that said, you know, aviation survival men had to, you took care of parachutes was I was a pair, a former paratrooper. So I was like, oh, right on, took care of weapons. I was a former, you know, army. And so all these things lined up. And then at the very bottom, it said, and must complete Navy, uh, Navy rescue swimmer school. And I go, what's that? 
And the recruiter goes, oh man, it's frog nose shit. You'll love it. So I was in and I wound up joining. I went to a group Monterey. I know it's a tough duty. Group Surfed Monterey. my ass up, up there. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was a good place. And uh, saw some crazy shit there. And then got, got orders to, uh, to ASMA school where I met a bunch of cool people and graduated. And uh, then <laughs> wound up going to Air Station Brooklyn. It, which we, is no when, uh, longer there, by the way, which is no, I thought was interesting. No. Well, and, and the thing, too, is what a lot of people don't understand. It was like in our generation of rescue swimmers, they were progressively starting the program. So, like, I went to Air Station Brooklyn with um, two other uh, class members, Craig Dunbar, who's no longer with us, and another guy named Joe Burns. We all went together to Air Station Brooklyn because they were beefing up for the program. So we went through the whole implementation and we did all that stuff. Three years later, I go from Air Station Brooklyn to Air Station Corpus Christi, and they were doing, they would just started doing the implementation there. So it was a slow progression. It wasn't like every unit got rescue swimmers right away. Right. They were slowly doing it. Yep. So I got to do the implementation of the swimmer program a couple of times. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's, that's pretty awesome. I, that's I, I just want, well, at Air Station Brook, I met my, uh, my rescue swimmer mentor. And I know uh, Georgie Porgy Cavallo mentioned him, but he's, he's a great leader. One of the best leaders I've ever met was a guy named Steve Ober. Number rescue one, swimmer rescue number swimmer. one, actually. Number, numero uno. Yeah. But, uh, he, was, he, he, was, he was awesome. He was like, he motivated me like in so many ways and got my head on straight. And he, a lot of things I thought, man, this isn't right. You know, why am I doing this? And then later on i was like oh he's just he's showing me how to do things and he would sit me down he was the only guy i've ever met that like he could sit me down and chew me out but yeah like when i came out of his office i felt great i was like awesome this is you know, i don't know how he did it but he did it, it was great you're he, being he was, a dumbass yes oh i totally am. yeah 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 that's exactly what it was like he was like yeah <laughs> he was a he was an amazing mentor i was very lucky to have him and and actually in my early career i was, I was lucky to have a lot of good mentors um when I went from Brooklyn, I went to um, Corpus, like I said, and there was a, a non-rescue swimmer ASM chief there named Frank Patterson. And uh, that guy, you know, he was totally on board with the swimmer program, but he used to argue with me about everything. And I asked him one time, because he would argue with me about things that I knew that he agreed with. So finally, I said, chief, why, why, are, you, why are you arguing with me? And he told me, he goes, you have to be able to verbally uh, articulate why you're doing this you have to rationale the reason for when you go up before these officers why you're doing this so he he trained me to to argue <laughs> That's he was awesome. great so i was really lucky yeah i was really lucky um I, i'm going to talk a little bit more into when you and i like just about our our meetings and stuff yeah. while i was in kodiak because uh while i was in kodiak I actually, oh right no kidding uh, but I learned yeah. uh, quite a bit from you and George while I was there. And there's a couple of things that stand out to me. And I, I actually mentioned this when I was talking to George is Bob Watson sat down with me and said, you need to watch talking to me, said, you need to watch Olaf and George, senior chief in chief and how they lead yeah, and yeah. what they do, because they are going as a team and they're fighting for you, even though you don't see it all the time, they're fighting for you and us in the shop and, and I took that to heart for everything that you guys did, walking in, you know, talking to the C-130 guys. And I remember, again, having a conversation with you and you're like, you need to go get C-130 qualified. And I remember kind of looking at you sideways, like, I need to do what? And you said, everybody does it. You're going to stand one month, like out of your, like one month every two years, like on the C-130 side. But that's it. Trust me, it'll, it'll make things nice. And I was like, oh. And it shuts them up. It did. And it, but it, it was amazing to me, like how, wow, the, you give, you give just enough. And then you guys always fought, like, we don't have the manpower. We got a guy on leave. You got a guy over in Cold Bay, a guy over in Cordova. You know, this guy just got launched out to North Slope. And like, what, where do you and want we always, to Yeah, we always had to have a couple swimmers. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then they start, if you remember, they started uh, putting us on the back of, because prior to. Um, us being there they never put swimmers on the back of the alpat ships remember right. that when they started yeah. putting us on? so that was another deployment that we had to do so yeah they they, they stretch us pretty thin you know very but, much uh, so you know but it, you you it was you funny you say that because the whole the whole thing at, at kodak at that time and george and i 
talked about this extensively is it was such a great aligning of all the stars of the personalities that everybody was there. You know, you had like, I come off, I do come off kind of gruff and I know that, whereas I, that's why I'd always bring George with me because I was, and everyone used to joke around because we could never be seen with each other because he was my face guy. I'll yeah. never forget. We tell the story about, there was a, when we, do you remember when we ran survival school? Yes. <laughs> A there couple was, of them, a, actually, because you guys who, had to do, was, like, videos and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Like, you guys are yeah, up in, the, like, the training room, and you're you're pointing at stuff on the stick. This is a strobe light. This is how you turn it on. <laughs> and then you had to have me come in there and, like, this is how you demonstrate using a life vest. <laughs> oh, my God, I forgot about that. Oh. And, um, but there was there was one pilot that uh, he was arguing with uh, – with, I think it was like Will Milam and, and Bob Watson and, and Jason Bunch and, and those guys saying that because he went through the Pensacola survival school, he shouldn't have to go through our survival school. So anyways, long story short, I was up at this commander's desk and I was just going off and George says it was beautiful because I'm, you know, cursing and I'm, and he goes, their spit was just flying out of my mouth all over this poor guy's desk. And I stopped and then George, without even missing me, goes, well, what CNC means to say is that he said it so beautifully and tactfully exactly what I said. <laughs> Like that's why he's my face guy. That's why he does what he does. Oh, I, I loved it. I loved watching you guys yeah. work. Just and it was, I was kind of like I was. I was a third class. I was a boot swimmer, yeah. and so I didn't get to see the the level as to what you guys did. You know, whereas Bob, Will, Dave, Toppy, um, Kurt Rebels, those guys had all been either second class or yeah. first class. So those guys had a more intricate relationship and uh got to see the upside but to listen to bob and kurt and will and those guys even jason bunch coming down and said, just watch these guys from time to time and it was like i said it was impressive yeah, those, and, and like, and like we said i mean those those guys i mean the whole the whole shop at that point was was just it was phenomenal it was great i mean yeah there there wasn't a bad egg in the in the whole group i mean honestly it, you I, know our weakest link was was the best of everyone else yeah. i still stand by that I so, can't agree with you more. I'm so glad that you got to go there. That was your first station too. So that, yeah, I'm so yeah. glad that was your first station. Yeah. That's oh, definitely me too. setting the bar pretty high. You know, I, I remember walking in the shop with you guys, uh, like the whole shop. And it was like, holy cow, I'm coming into an A game. I need to, uh, I need to make sure I, my shit is up to speed. So, you know, like. You, do you, were you there? Were you there when the stand team refused to work, do our swimmer workout with us? I'm not going to say his name, but he, the stand team was coming down to check us. Yep. And we're like, we were just going to have a normal swimmer workout. We're like, hey, come come swim with us. He was like, oh, no. Oh, no. He goes, I've heard about you guys. I was, that was great. Uh, I don't remember that. So I'm going to say it was probably just before I got there. But it, it wouldn't surprise it, it me if been. it was like as soon as I got there, too. And it was just because every workout that we had in the pool on the – it was just game on. I was like, woo. So yeah. we had fun. Yeah, it really was. And, you know, I remember, I remember being – I, I laugh now because it seemed like I was so old back then. I was like maybe 30 when I was a senior chief there and George, you know, and I were there and I'm looking over, I'm looking at you, Jason Bunch, all these like young, just tough. You know, like, I gotta, I gotta compete with these young, hard, you know, George used to have the best expression. He goes, he goes all off. They're just a bunch of wild dogs that we have to just, you know, you let them out on their leash a little bit, let them, let them do their thing. Then pull them back every once in a while. But then, you know, let him go, man. And I'm like, right on. And that, that was, that's absolutely right. Oh, God, what a great, great shop. Time. It was a great time. Yeah, it really was. I, I don't, I don't think I, I'd ever been in a shop as good as that one. No, uh, no, I haven't either. And I, it was amazing. Amazing. I mean, what a way to start my career. I just, yeah, like all the You're advice. Very from lucky all the guys. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I actually specifically still remember to this day, that a uh, piece of advice that you had given me and, I, it, it was a sewing project. You had said, hey, I need you to go sew up blank, whatever bag, whatever we needed to do. And mm -hmm. and and I remember saying to you, like, you know, can you, I, I don't remember the formula for the, to do, to make the circle and this, that, and the other thing. And you looked at me and said, it's not that you need to remember everything. It's you need to know where to look everything up in order to find the answer. And I That's was right. like, Oh, that is beautiful. And I, I take that today. Yep. I give that same advice. It was an amazing advice. So everybody out there is listening. Well, thank you. You don't need to remember everything, but you need to know where to look no. everything up to find the answer. 
So, and where is the answer? Yeah. On the back of a freaking meter stick. And I'm like, really? Yeah, on, on the back of on the back of the room, right there, <laughs> for the diameter and the radius. I still right. remember that. Oh, it was beautiful. So I, I I can't tell you the formula, but I can still tell you where to get it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right now it's called Google. <laughs> oh, oh my God. I, I don't even know. I don't even know what like the swimmer thing is like now because did they go paperless with the CMS cards and everything? I they, it was that way when I was when I got on out. that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you did I, everything. I can't online. imagine like not going out to a plane. I can't imagine going out to a plane without like your CMS card and everything else because I mean that was that was like what was beat into us and we beat that into you guys is always have a CMS card with you no matter what you did because that was you know. Yep. Anyways. Yeah. Sorry, we're gonna look some technical for everybody probably. Yeah, no, it's all good. Um, I would like to ask you about a story to share because I, I remember this story, but I only remember bits and pieces. And while we were in Kodiak, you and Terry Bertram uh, were in the army together. God bless Terry Bertram. Right? And, oh God. Well, we didn't guy. know that though. No, that's what that's what was so fun about this. So you're kind of one of the first events in aviation, uh, as far as I uh, as far as I remember, were you talking about was this one with Terry? Uh, Enlighten, oh, please. The, you're talking about the Spain? Yes. Yeah, we, uh, Terry and I, Terry and I were both in the 82nd Airborne Division. Totally different units, didn't know each other. And, and during the time of Grenada, there was also a, a special kind of like um, showing of the colors to the King of Spain and everything like that. So we, you know, we flew over there, did some jumps and did some other stuff. But at one point, and Terry and I, like I said, we didn't even know we, each other we were on this plane and it caught fire and like everything's going crazy. And we're, it was, it was a nutty time. And the funniest thing was when, uh, when I checked into a school, um, cause you know, you're going to that big donut, you got the big dorms, yep. like, you know, what is it, like a six, six man room. Yep. Terry was all the way at the end. He had already, he had already been there. He walks in and, and we just started BSing. He had like some 82nd airborne patch or something. I go, you know, what, what were you doing in the army? Oh no, no, I I remember it was he saw my uh, army achievement medal on my uh, uh, my ribbon. He's like, "What did you do in the army?" And I was like, "Oh, I was in the A And then we just started going over, and we're like, we're just like cracking up, going it, like whole like the whole circle of life. We like survived this this plane being on fire, and then we meet in in a. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you another funny story about Terry Burcham, that trickster. I love him to death. Him and I, because of our prior service. If I remember right, we were, yeah, we were the only two members in our class that had prior service. So I don't know if they did this when you were in, but like they took a survey of like, okay, how much time do you have in the service? Blah, blah, blah. And whoever had the most, boom, your class leader, whoever yep. the secondary was assistant class leader, right? Yep. Well, Terry, that, that smart SOB fudged his number. So I wound up being class leader and he was my assistant. I'm like, Terry, you were in longer than me. He's like, oh. <laughs> Smart man. He's, that's oh. why I learned that Terry was a little bit smarter than me. Dang. That guy. What? Ew. Yeah, he's great. Funny dude. <laughs> that's funny. He, I, I, it was, he, was, he was fun to go through high school. But there was, he was just a crack. He was a, he was a good morale relief. He was just uh, a funny dude. He was a, a hilarious in Kodiak, too. Some of the stuff he would say and do. Yeah, like, yeah. Terry. <laughs> oh, my God. Just off the wall off the wall oh, but i mean and, and usually at the right time like right when you needed that like that that comedic you know little blow off thing you know things were getting too high that he he was funny he's a great guy like i said like like i said before is is i stand by this is our weakest guy at that, that point at camelot kodiak was still better than anyone else yeah yeah, and, and it, I, I, don't, I couldn't even say who our weakest. I was probably our weakest guy, you know. I, mean? I don't know. So, I was kind of the junior guy. I'm saying <laughs> now, but I'm just saying, like physically and everything. I don't know, but yeah, everyone was everything. Everybody came together. It's just like you said. Even Bob Watson, Jason Bunch, Will Milam, all those guys yeah. naturally mentored you yeah. without even having to be told. You know, oh, and then and then it's oh, awesome. It, it, the whole thing, and like I learned from you guys, and you know, it's just, it was a great experience, and everything was was just a great. A great time. One of the funniest stories, and I know we're going to get into Kodak stories, but I, I went away. I don't know. I think you were there for this. I, I had gone away on leave, and uh, and George and George had just he had just he was a new chief, and I remember you know um, telling him, "Hey man, you know you're a chief now. You know you, you can't you know you got to 
watch what you say because people take a lot more to heart. And I came back from the shot. And George has always been, like I said, he's always been just the, he was George, you know, I mean, no matter what, he was George. He was a great guy. He was the, the sensitive guy. He was the, the funny guy. You know, he, I mean, he could get into your butt, but not really that hard. But, uh, <laughs> and I came back and the whole shop was like in a, in a coup d'etat against George. And I'm like, so I said, all right, George, let's go for a run. You're like, I mean, everybody was sitting me down. Hey, CH, you know, I'm so glad you're back. I'm so glad you're back. You know, Chief Cavallo has gone crazy with power, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and I, and I remember him and I going for a right, uh, a run. I'm like, George, what happened, man? He's like, and, and it was something stupid about name tags or something like that. And he goes, I was trying to do what you would do. I'm like, dude, dude you can't do that. You have to be George. You have to be back. I said, you try to come off like me. It's going to come. They're going to know you're faking it. They're going to call you on it. And that's what happened. <laughs> it was, it was, it was just, like I said, was, lessons learned all the way around. It was great. Yeah. Oh, that's Love hilarious. It. Die. I haven't thought about these stories in years, dude. This is awesome. This I love this. I absolutely love this. Um, but I do I I gotta back up before Kodiak and I want to ask you about your very first rescue. And I specifically asked about the very first rescue because like okay, mine was mine was uh mine was much crazier than most, but you know, there I mean George talks about his going to save a dog, so (laughs) I love yeah, I know the very first rescue. My, my, well, okay. Being, being, it was at air station, Brooklyn, of course, my very first rescue, I still have the, the rescue summer message from it was, it was a sinking, um, a boat sinking. And at that time, you know, we had the 65s and I remember like running to the, uh, to the plane and the, the pilot was like, oh, should we take the pump or should we take the swimmer? Or should we take the pump or should we take the swimmer? He opted to take me. We flew out there and there was just two guys in a raft. Now, mind you, there was no debris, there was no fuel, there was nothing in there. So I go in there, you know, we rescued, we pull those guys out and we come back. And then like, I mean, like a week later, I had to sit down with a bunch of like uh, CI investigators and stuff like asking me if there was debris. They thought it was a big insurance thing. The guy, I guess the guy was like in debt. (laughs) So I'm like, of course, in New York, that's what I get for my first rescue, an insurance scam. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. It It was good though. Yeah, but I was so excited. The one thing here's here's my own personal was I was so amped and so like jazzed and wanted to like get into the fray. Was December in the Atlantic, I jumped you know with those old Henderson dry suits without my without my gloves, and <laughs> <laughs> I never did that ever again. <laughs> yeah, never yeah, again. it gets a little chilly out there. I mean, it's not Kodiak cold, but it. it oh my gosh, uh, the Atlantic gets a, a yeah. bit chilly in the in the middle of winter. <laughs> yes it does well the, i i do believe that there's a point to where it's just cold i mean like you get yeah. to a point you're just it's beyond it's like i can't even feel any colder this this is yeah. it you know <laughs> i don't i don't care if it's like you know 30 below or 40 below it's still cold <laughs> that's hilarious so that's my first that was my first rescue that's awesome um and actually you and i had talked a little bit more you had another rescue out of brooklyn that was uh that was pretty good too off the top of my head oh, that, well i think yeah, i had a couple of them uh there was the one I got the air medal, which I, I'm going to read here in a minute. All right, it, it because everything I do in my life, Jason, it has to have some kind of sense of humor to it. Um, <laughs> that I don't know if you want me to tell this before or after you read it, but no, I'll I'm, tell you I'll, what. Let, let's get right into that. Let go me, ahead let and me, read it. Let me, yeah, 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 yeah. Because this is a this is a pretty good award, and and I'm you know like yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing the backstory to this because I don't I don't know this okay. either. No, we never I, talked about much of our past stuff, did we, in Kodiak? We never really, no. George and I never really talked about our stuff. We just, I don't think anybody did. Yeah, no, it, this is, like, it was never a, a a boast. It was, that's the greatest part about no. what we do and and who we are is, is the rescue swimmer world. Nobody talks about this stuff. It's amazing to me, and I love hearing it, and this is kind of why I do this. But um, anyway, so yeah, let, let me read I'm this. I'm glad thing. you do. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, me too. All right. I got, I got the air metal tattoo on the side of my neck, so it's all right. Yes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, go ahead. Citation to accompany the award of the air metal to Aviation Survivalman, third class, Olaf Lavelle, United States Coast Guard. 
Petty Officer Lavelle is cited for heroic achievement in aerial flight on evening of 25 November 1989 while serving as rescue swimmer and emergency medical technician on board Coast Guard Helicopter 6565. The air crew was engaged in a medical evacuation of a critically injured crew member of a fishing vessel located approximately 20 miles off the coast of Long Island, New York. Arriving on scene, the air crew found the vessel pitching and rolling wildly in 30 knot winds and 10 foot seas. Petty Officer Lavelle realized that the hoist could not be completed without trained assistance from the deck of the storm tossed vessel. Without regards for his own safety, he was deployed into the dark, frigid waters and fought his way to the vessel. After climbing aboard, he immediately administered life saving first aid and prepared the injured crew member for hoisting. Working in a cramped, four square foot space, the only available hoisting, Petty Officer Lavelle facilitated a successful hoist of the patient from the vessel. Realizing his assistance would be needed to care for the patient while en route to the hospital, Petty Officer Lavelle again, without hesitation, entered into the water and was recovered by the aircrew. En route to the hospital, he continued to treat the patient. Petty Officer Lavelle's actions were instrumental in the rescue of the injured crew member. His courage, judgment, and devotion to duty are most heartily commended in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Coast Guard. That is badass, dude. 30, <laughs> you, 30 knot winds, 10 foot seas, and you're getting into the water to swim to the vessel. And yeah. then after you hoist a guy, well, you got to get back in the water. What? Yeah. Well, and that's, and the crew, the, the boat crew men were like, dude, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm getting back. And, and of course, we know. For us, I'd much rather jump into the water oh. and get hoisted out of the water than off of a boat. So, you know, oh, yeah. to them, it's crazy. But to us, I'm like, I'm, I, will, I don't want to have anything around me. I don't want to, I don't want to get <laughs> nailed. But, but the, the funny thing was uh, the guy had just sustained a major head injury. There was blood everywhere. So when we, when we got him, in fact, I called on the, the old PRC-90, the one, the one that worked, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the one PRC-90 that worked, that, uh, that like they had one shot at this hoist because this guy was like, I said, just, you know, worst case scenario, throw down my EMT kit and I'll ride this thing in the, uh, the coast guard boats couldn't come out because of the, of the waves and stuff. So the, the fly mech was, um, Douglas Bullock at the time. And he, and he did a great job hoisting. But once we got up, you know, as you, as you're getting pulled into the cabin, as you know, you're, you're facing it. There was blood all over like the inside, all over the, the back of the pilot's helmet, blood all over the flight mech, Doug Bullock's, face you know the 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 visor all that right and so he put him in the back and doug was trying to be proactive he had taken some medical courses and he actually opened up my thompson pack and when i got there i was trying i was gonna i was looking at the patient and the guy had like you know he was pretty clean cut for you know wasn't wasn't real scroungy or anything like that you know there me making my judgmental things on him but uh so i'm like i couldn't find my gloves i don't i don't know what happened to him I don't know if they like actually got swept out when Doug opened my Thompson packs. So I'm like, you know what? Screw it. What's the chance of this guy having anything? Right when I thought that, I found I, my gloves just kind of like appeared. It was the weirdest thing ever. So I put them on. I worked on them. We got him to the hospital. And like I said, blood was ever. Long story short was we found the guy had like, interve- he was an intravenous drug user, had like HIV, HEP. Yeah. He had, name it. He had like all the alphabets. So I was like, oh my God. And then flying back, from uh because this is way out on long island flying back the the helicopter the 65 caught fire so we had mm-hmm. to do an emergency landing yeah no it's, it's, like i said everything i do has to have some kind of joke involved with it <laughs> so we made an emergency landing and uh one of the pilots uh lieutenant chris bauer and the other the other pilot was a uh, lieutenant joe uh turbo taroski great guys but uh they made these calls to because they called the air station and the air station was like yeah it'll take us like a couple hours to get the duty driver out all the way on Long Island because we we're like way out of Montauk. Um, so uh, Chris Bauer called up the local uh, law enforcement, and it was funny as anything because Montauk is a very, let's just say, wealthy community. So this this six foot six, strapping, you know, New York State trooper guy with everything gleaming and shining shows up. You know, hello, gentlemen, and we sit in his car. It's beautiful. It's pristine. And he even offers, he's like writing, he throws on the light. He's like, hey, you guys want to stop at 7-Eleven? You guys, I know you guys probably don't carry your wallets. I'll pay it. You know, thank you. And he takes us right to the border of Nassau County, which is a little bit closer to the, inner, you know, to the, to, to the city of New York. Yep. 
Well, that guy wasn't as squared away as the, the state trooper as he handed us off. That guy was like on his retirement. And in fact, he's pointing out like, see that guy right there? That guy's drunk. I'm going to get over here. You know, it was, it was so funny. So then we get, now we've been in one car this whole time, the whole crew. We get into, right on the Ascar, it's on Flatbush, on, not on Flatbush, but on the, uh, the Brooklyn Parkway. And there's like three NYPD cars out there. They split us all up. And, and I swear, and then they started flipping the, the Nassau County cop shit look at him he ain't, he ain't highway look at those he ain't wearing fucking boots wait. i'm like holy shit and you know how we had the cam lights on our uh on our on our mask and stuff yeah oh yeah i put my mask in the back of the trunk she's like look at this guy he thinks he's fucking ghostbusters <laughs> I, I, seriously you're busting my ball dude so we uh it was me and me and i think i think joe taroski were in one cop car and we had these two guys and i all they had to do was go down the, the go down the parkway and maybe, maybe like, it should have taken like maybe 10 minutes. Dude, they milk that crap out for a while. They, it took like at least 45 minutes to get us all back there. And these guys even turned off their radio and put on like, like elevator music. And they didn't even talk. They grunted at each other. So I always say like, that was the, the watching of the de-evolution of man. Like you go for the strapping guy, like all the way to grunting apes, you know, like, rrr, rrr. but anyway, that, it was a funny thing. Good rescue. What a case. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Isn't it funny though? That, I can't uh, do anything normal. Oh, <laughs> then the, the, oh the other God. bad thing that well, the, the bad one that happened. Well, it's funny because um, as I was talking with George before this, because you know, I was kind of I was kind of hesitant and nervous because I don't like usually talking about all these things. But uh well, the, I appreciate the air it. metal thing was like funny, you know, the air metal thing was, was it's good. And, and it doesn't affect me anymore or anything like that, you know, but like, there's other ones that like, you know, they still kind of bother me. Like I, I, there was this, um, a family and their church group was out on Rockaway beach. And we got a call that there was this missing kid, seven, eight, seven to eight year old kid. Yeah. So we come up on, we come upon him and you know, he's in the, he's in the surf line. He's, you know, just floating. They lowered me down. I grabbed him and, uh, pull him, you know, pull him to the sand. I started doing CPR immediately. And unfortunately, like right behind me is like his family and the church. And they're just, you know, of course, they're just like, besides themselves, bawling and just traumatized. Yeah. Well, on the other side are these, um, for lack of a better word, these little ghetto kids that live, you know, right there at Rockaway. And they're like, you know, that, that MF is dead. Check his wallet, you know, all this stuff like that. What? First time in my life I've ever been. <laughs> yeah, it was terrible. And the first time in my life I've ever been so happy to see a police officer this this nypd guy comes up he's like he just looks at me he's like what can i do to help and i pointed at those guys those kids i go get these guys out of here and uh you would have thought it was like christmas his birthday and everything rolled in one he pulled out his billy club and it was like nothing to see here and starts swinging <laughs> <laughs> holy smoke but, yeah unfor unfortunately that, that kid didn't make it yeah wow that that's that and that that's what george and i were talking about like it's not it's not the big cases sometimes that get to you yeah it's it's those little ones you know things like that you know but i totally agree and there's some yeah. that stand out to me no awards no no glory yeah. uh that they, they, like they resonate with you for quite a while so yeah i call yeah. i call them my ghost like yeah. you know those are the ones that you that when you you know and we'll talk about that another time but those yeah. are the ones that uh come back to you when you get older and you're sitting there in the dark and you're like and they they just come out of nowhere just like boom yeah. so anyways oh, yeah that got on the press sorry about that no you're good what you're else? good what hey, you this, well actually i oh, then, i'll go ahead no go ahead no I was, gonna, I was gonna say then we can move on to corpus christi which yeah that's at, where i want to go we were there, this is great Corpus Christi at the during the time that we were there, and this is with, with Frank Patterson, um, Al Yates, Dave, uh, Dave Gray, uh, Bill Letty, Harold Hoffmaster, uh, Brian Doolittle, really some really outstanding individuals. Um, but at one point, we were having so many gory and nasty cases routinely that we actually got a call like, hey, you know, you guys need to get some relief from the stand team, which well, that's one of their jobs is to call them up and say, Hey, you guys need help. You know, you guys doing okay. Yeah. You know, of course us being swimmers, nobody's going to sit there and admit weakness, you know, but yeah. And poor, I mean, Al used to get, he got hit on a lot of them. 
Yeah. Know, obviously, well, you to this uh, and for anybody that hasn't listened to Al Yates, go back and find Al Yates' episode. And you're, yeah. uh, it's it's wild. And I want to actually talk about one of the ones that you and him were in together. And that was the, the you're talking about the plane crash. Yes. Because I, I would love to hear your yeah. perspective of that. Well, Al, I mean, Al, Al, when I listened to, to Al, um, Al's perspective, like he really, it was, it was amazing to listen to it because listening to him think the way that I, you know, things that I was thinking, but I would never admit to thinking back then, you know, like one of the things he states is like, when we pulled up the, uh, the pilot with half a head, there was yeah. no place I didn't want, I didn't want to be there at all. It was right. like, you know, cause he, obviously you're not going to revive him. This thing. And then the plane got a, a, a a chip light it had to fly back so we're swimming around with this guy for a half an hour you know and 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 then uh so you, you pretty much know that whole thing that the only difference is um well well al talks about like he went back and drank you know a couple six packs of beer to cool down i still was on duty and i and i'll never forget um dave gray to his credit came in and was like hey man you know do you want me to take your duty for you? He, he actually came in on his own and said, Hey, do you want me to take your duty for you? And I was like, some macho jackass. And I was like, Oh no, no, no. So, but we, at, in Corpus, what they used to do is they used to put us on a beeper and we used to stay down at the BO, the Navy's BOQ and the pilots and the whole air crew would stay down there. And then they'd beep you and you'd go down to the air station. You actually didn't stay at the air station, but it was only like, you know, five minutes away, but they yeah. used to have this little pizza place there. And, uh, and Dave Gray was awesome. And he was like, hey, man, just let me let me take you out for some pizza. I'm like, all right. And as soon as we walked in, there there were the, uh, I think it was the F-16 pilots crying right when we walked in. Oh, I'm man. Like, oh, shit, you know. And then and then the waitress who we had, she kept on grilling us. Were you guys on that rescue? You know, blah, blah, blah. You know, it was it was bad. So, of course, because because it's Olaf. I get to the BOQ and I'm thinking, all right, I'm just going to sit there and just blur this out. I'm going to throw in because we used to have like HBO in there and everything else like that in our room. Yeah. Well, something happened and, and the room that they had assigned me got, I don't know, assigned to somebody else or something. So they had sticking in this other room, which had no radio, no TV, nothing. So I'm just sitting there in the dark for the rest of the night just going, man, this sucks. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, because yeah. you got to relive the whole thing as you're thinking about it, like nothing to distract you yeah wow yeah. i i should have you know looking back i should have taken dave up on his on his uh on his offer that would have been the the prudent thing to do but <laughs> being a young young dumb rescue swimmer you know we used to have that that saying that you know you never take my bullet i'll never take your bullet you don't take mine you know meaning you know if if, if it's destined that i'm gonna get it i'm gonna get it yeah so you know Anyways, so that's that's why I didn't do it, but I should have done it. In fact, Corpus, George, I, and this never came up until actually Kodiak. George had flown, uh, he was, when he was in air station Clearwater, he was also C-130 qualified, and he had flown into Corpus Christi one day. And he, he walks into maintenance control, and he's like, hey, is, you know, is Olaf here? They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, he's got back on the star case. He's out in the wash rack. And I don't, I don't remember this at all. I remember seeing George, but George says he walks around and there I am like, I'm just covered in blood and I'm like washing myself with the, um, you know, the, the, the wash, the, the, yeah. the hose from the wash rack. I'm like, George, what's going on? He's like, dude, stay away from me. But I, don't, I don't remember what case it was uh, to this day. I mean, we had so many of those repetitiously, you know, I, I, uh, there was a guy who got a shotgun. Um, they had, they had these little islands out there in Texas that you could, I guess you could rent them and like little fish cabins. Yep. And this, this family had rented one and the, the, when they went out there, somebody was out there and, and wound up shooting uh, the husband in front of his kid and his wife. And then oh. this, just a passing, a passing a uh, boat happened to like catch them and like picked them up. And then we met it back to them off of that. Yeah. So things like what? that. Texas. Jeez. God Come on Corpus Christi. Holy smoke. Yeah, good times. Oh, uh, here, here's a funny one for you. Here's because, <laughs> like I said, you know, everything's got to be funny. Corpus Christi, <laughs> um, the uh, you know, SPI, uh, South Padre Island is also another famous um college spring break place, right? Right. Well, we got a call during during that time frame that uh, um, 
a plane had gone down, a Cessna had gone down. So we fly out there and <laughs> we're, we're circling and we see the Cessna totally upside down on the beach. It was like in, in, inward a little bit, but it was on the beach and it was upside down. So the pilot lowers me down and I'm walking around and I'm looking at the, looking around the, the area for, at the Cessna and like there's all these uh, um, Lone Star beer and Budweiser cans, you know, just screwed about. And <laughs> this one guy holding a Budweiser can, and I swear to you, he had Daisy Duke shorts on, a big knot on his head. And there was like, you could tell he was like, he's been, he was in this, this plane crash. He comes up trying to play it off. What's going on here? I'm like, dude, were you just in this plane crash? <laughs> I'm like, come here. And then, and then th this is what I love about coming out of a helicopter. This, uh, we had, we had, I was putting him on the Miller body board and uh, this lady comes up to me. She goes, I'm just an ER nurse, but can I help you? And I'm like, yeah, just uh, continue doing the struts. <laughs> like, because she thinks, because I'm, I come out of a helicopter that I'm like uber, like, you know, medically trained. She's like so far above me. I'm like, yeah, I just want to take care of those straps. And I'm looking, <laughs> I'm looking around. I love it. And I'm looking around and there's this guy with his clavicles, like almost vertical. And he's old, and he's also in Daisy Dukes. I don't know what it was about the Daisy Duke things, but he, and he's also drinking a, one of those PBR beers. Like, damn, what's it going? I'm like, come here, dude, come here. Oh and my like, god! I had to like, pull him in. Like, yeah, it was funny as anything. Like, and they tried to play it. And and what what the pilot wound up telling me what happened was, uh, uh, they were trying to show off, you know, for the for the college kids, and they were trying to do like a loop de loop with their Cessna, and obviously they they were unsuccessful on their loop. <laughs> <laughs> funny funny thing though oh they Anyways. survived and, and you yeah, apparently yeah, helped yeah, them oh and here's uh another dave gray i'll never <laughs> that son of a bitch dave gray had had duty and it was like and we used to we used to get off um you know we would uh switch duty at three o'clock and it was like 2 30 everyone else was gone it was just me and dave in the at the station and dave looks at me I even think it was a Friday. And Dave goes, man, I really hope I get a star case right now. I go, you're nuts. I go, you could be gone for a long time. I said, you know, you're crazy. I swear to you, Jason, the star alone goes off, right? He goes running off and they're like, you know, oh yeah, we need another swimmer too. So he sucked me into his <laughs> fantasy. And we wound up, we wound up medevacking these two, the, um, these two uh, crew member from, uh, from the ship, the, uh, the boiler had blown up. And Dave had arrived first and he got the, the first person, which was, God, my guy was like, uh, probably 80% of his body was just nothing but second and third degree. His fingers were fused together. And it was, you know, and I don't mean to be mean, but like, he was like Pakistani or something. And he didn't have, he didn't speak a lot of English. So all he kept on saying to me was hot, hot, hot. I'm like, yeah, I know, man, I know, I know. I mean, I mean, what can you do? You're just doing the best you can. But I felt so bad for like, and then when you drop him off at the hospital, you and I both know that. The, the burn, you know, to treat the burns is almost as bad as the burn itself. So I was just yeah. not bad. Just drop it. Oh, no, man, you're going to, you're in for a world of hurt. Jeez, yeah. oh, man. Of things, man. You know, I, uh, yeah. actually, Dave, Dave talks to me about that, uh, that case. And, Does he really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, it, so yeah. When, when that, uh, yeah, he's yeah you don't have to go back and listen to that one. Too. <laughs> Holy smoke. God, yeah, you, corporate, you really corporate, got I mean, a lot of stuff in there. Yeah. And then, and then, yeah, so Corpus, from there, I mean, and this, went, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, no. Uh, from there, I went to, uh, I went to the rescue swimmer stand team at ATC Mobile. Mobile. Yep. <laughs> and uh, then, without, within almost a month of being in the stand team, is when I was involved in that class A plane crash, the helicopter crash with the, uh, the 6555. Where, Which uh, uh, there are not too many people I know that have survived such a such a crash. So what what happened it was there? A, yeah, it was an eventful thing. Well, um, it all started off to be you know <laughs> there was one of the other members of the stand team at that time was Mark Galbraith, great guy. And uh, for remember how I was telling you like you never take somebody else's bullet. Well, yeah. he was actually scheduled for that flight. And I was just being generous. And I was like, hey, Mark, you got something going on? I said, I got nothing going on. So I'll just, I'll take that training flight for you. He's like, are you sure, man? I'm like, yeah, man, I'll take it. 
yeah, stupid me. This is why you never take the bullet for somebody else. So we go off on this training flight and, um, the, it was, um, we did, we did rescue swimmer ops and then we were going to go into auto rotations. Now this is where I kind of blame myself a little bit because, um, you know, in the 3710 at that time, which is the air ops manual, it said, you know, you should have minimal crew for auto rotations. And I'm like, Hey, I don't, you know, when they, when they did the swim they were coming back to the, go into the air, the auto rotations. I'm like, I really shouldn't, you know, be on here. I was kind of speaking up and I kind of got peer pressured. Hey, you know, well, if you want us to drop you off, we can. So of course I shut my mouth and we did three great auto rotations, you know, on a 65, which falls like a rock at that time, at least yeah. anyways. So they were switching over. They were switching over from the, uh, the aircraft commander to the, the co-pilot and he was going to do his three auto rotations we just started the initial auto rotation and we i mean almost immediately we lost nr and nr is of course the rotor speed right so i mean it was almost instantaneously so we started falling like a rock and uh the aircraft commander okay he had his hands full of aircraft there's no scarier sight than like looking you know how you sit in that uh that little pillow in the back of the 65 and oh, you can yeah. see like the whole dashboard yeah. you know Nothing what actually there are not too many people that, that really understand that so the back of the h65 the dolphin there are there's like literally three seats there's a pilot seat on the right side the co-pilot seat on the left side the flight mechanic seat which is in the just behind the two pilot seat and then we get a as swimmers we get a cushion that's all of like two to three inches thick and we're leaning up against yep. the wall and that is what we connect to in the back of that aircraft it is a uh Small working so basically area. Basically sitting on the floor. Yeah. 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 Basically yeah. sitting on the floor. It's, it's, it's sitting on the deck. So, um, so yeah. So, nothing scary than, like, looking out. And all I see, like, in the, in the throughout the, the because you got a great view in the 65. It's all windows. But out the front, all you see is green because the grass is coming up. And then nothing but red segments across the dashboard. And uh, we're just falling. And the, the aircraft commander tried to, tried to gain back nr by dipping the the helicopter even more to, to get some rotor speed going so we're like we're, i mean so like we were going down 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 yeah and uh so i at one point i was just as we're falling i'm just like all right you know i'm gonna die let's just wait for the pain because i'm expecting like the main gearbox to come crashing through down on me and everything else and uh <laughs> so we're, we're falling and then um at the last minute the aircraft commander pulls up but nobody had pushed up the uh uh, PCLs, so we had we, he had nothing there, so it went whoop, and we hit into the ground, and the landing gear came up and crushed the the basket in the back, and then we made like a 279 foot trench, and then what happened was the the one of the main rotor blades, uh, caught onto and, and actually uh, cut into the tail rotor drive shaft, which you know flipped us over, yeah, and uh, and then the 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 swimmer window for lack of a better word came in and smacked me and i'm just sitting there looking and, and i'm in just nothing but a shorty right so i'm scared to death of like fire at this point because i'm like this thing's gonna melt to me everyone else and one of the funniest things the flight mate told me later i mean after this whole thing <laughs> was uh he's like you know what olaf he's like you guys give us all this training wait eight to set eight to ten seconds for all motion to stop he goes Nick, he goes i'm on like three and he goes all i feel is your booty foot climbing onto my <laughs> i was out of there dude I was, I'll be the first, because I, I popped, because we were still sitting on our right side. So I popped off the, uh, the uh, uh, emergency uh, exit and climbed out and uh, set a bunch of explosives, got on the PRC-90. Then I looked out and I saw that the aircraft commander was trapped and he was trying to bang on his door to get out. I went over there and pulled him out and took off my shorty wetsuit to use it as a, um, a sea collar because he, he was, he was, his back was effed up. Then the co-pilot kind of fell down in, in there. And he said, he, he, and to this day, I hate this expression. He goes, after all this, he goes, my bad. I go, shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah. My, yeah. My bad. Yeah. That's a, yeah. Hey, listen, so, I'm all about taking ownership of your mistakes. But yeah. <laughs> my bad. <But> there's, <laughs> so, uh, so he, uh, uh, so it was, it was funny because, like, all I'm sitting there is, is UT's the flight mech had climbed out and he's like laying on the top of the helicopter. Uh, finally, after a bunch of people came, 
they I helped the the ambulance people load the every the crew on there. And this guy comes over and goes, man, can you, can you imagine what it was like on there? I'm like, I was on there, man. Because <laughs> nobody associated because I didn't have a flight suit. I was just in the, yeah. these UDT shorts and a, and a T-shirt. And so uh, I went up to I went up to the uh, one of the police I was, or the air, uh, airport cops or whatever he was. I go, hey, man, I need to go right back to the Coast Guard base. You know, I'm holding my, my shorty wetsuit, my um, harness, my HB-11 harness and all that, you know, and my fins. He's like, I can't help you right now. So I'm like, I said some explanatives to him because I was I was pretty amped up. I walked over to the fire department. They told me basically the same thing. So I started in my mind. I thought I was on um, where the air, where the air station was, but I was actually all the way across town. We actually crashed at Brooklyn Field, which is all the way across Mobile. But I was like, I go F it. I'm gonna walk back. So I started walking out, and another 65 landed, and they were and their rotor was still going when they landed, and the co-pilot jumped out of his. Uh, chair and ran to me. He's like, "Get down, get down!" I probably looked a lot worse than I thought I did. A lot more shocky. Yeah. And uh, so I'm like, "Oh God, great! Another one's crashed." You know, <laughs> that's the first thing that's coming to my mind. So I'm like, "I'm getting down in the fetal." So they uh, they call an ambulance on me, and uh, the ambulance gets there. They put me in like you know full C spine immobilization. Yeah. Put me in the ambulance. Take me. The C spine ambulance. So you were like, "Hey, can I get a ride?" And they're like, "I don't have time." Oh, yeah. I'm to like, you. "Hey, man, just." Oh yeah, yeah. Oh wait, what what that medic say? My bad. <laughs> yeah, my bad. <laughs> so so uh, so they take me to the to the, uh, to the hospital to the emergency room, which is this is I told you, Jason. Nothing happens to me without some kind of humor. So they of course they hit me with blood, like right right before I even get into the trauma room one. They take me around in there, and I'm remember I'm just in UDTs, the swimmer shirt, and strapped to the stupid Miller bodyboard. And uh, with the seat collar on, and I'm gonna tell you right now, nobody, nobody ever um, takes you seriously when you're arguing. When you're strapped down like a fish. Nobody. <laughs> this, this, and actually, this gorgeous doctor kids it, and she starts, you know, she starts doing her full assessment, and she gets to the UDTs, and she goes, "How do these come off?" And I go, "Well, they don't have to come off, doc. I'm good." You know, and like I said, nobody takes you seriously when you're strapped down on the middle body board. So I didn't see Helga, the wonder nurse over here to my left. She comes over with those penny cutters and she's going to cut them off. And these are only the only things I have. I'm like, no, 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 don't, don't, don't cut them. I said, here, and I, you know, I showed the buckle. I said, they pull them down and, you know, she's checking me out, blah, blah, blah. And she's very impressed. And she walks around. Of course she is. <laughs> <laughs> she walks oh. around to the other side. Now, Jason, mind you, the, the trauma room one door is still open. I shit you not. The janitor sweeps by, stops, takes a look, and then keeps on sweeping. I'm like, like I'm on display. Then all I hear from the doctor talking to Helga, the wonder nurse over here, was blood about it rectal. So I'm like, what? I'm like flopping like a fish on the stupid Millie body board, right? I can't get off this thing. So she comes around to my feet on, on the, my right side, and she's like, well, you know, I want to check you for any spinal injuries that you may have, your spinal fluid that may be leaking into your, your anal cavity. I'm like, well, doc, that's, you don't have to do that. I, I rest assured I'm good, you know, and all this, I'm arguing with her. And I, the argument probably went on for about two to three minutes. And to her credit, she goes, yeah, you're probably right. And so I relaxed and she suckered me, boing, got me. I'm like, what's next, doc? You know, I'm like, God damn, give me a drink first. <laughs> so. Anyways, um, <laughs> at that point, I did everything wrong as, as far as like what I learned later from George, like from CISM. I, I got drunk, went home and did a bunch of crazy shit. And, and then there's a there's a, a swimmer that used to work for me in, uh, in Mobile. His name was Jay Machesney. Funny. He said the funniest thing to me because they actually asked me to come back in the next day. So I was there at 730. <laughs> Jay saw me. He goes. God damn, what do you need to do to get all day off around here? <laughs> I started <laughs> laughing. I thought that was the funny thing ever. Since. Oh my but, um, God. Yeah. So anyway, so then I go, I go and see the guys in the hospital. You know, hey, glad we made it, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. You know, and I credit I credit a lot with the, the aircraft commander because he really, you know, pulled us out. But uh after you know, and they all they now the, the aircraft commander had uh, pins put in his back, and unfortunately, he he his flying career was done. The co-pilot had um, he was in a sea collar for like nine months. 
the flight mix also six months. Now I was on that, I was on the, uh, <laughs> the little pillow on the deck, nothing. So, so I'm talking to each one of them. I'm like, you know, I'm glad we made it. Like I said, and, and then I was like, Hey, uh, now they all have confirmed back injuries. I'm like, did you guys get an, uh, a finger wave in your butt? And like, no, why would they do that? I'm like, I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. It was just me. <laughs> So, Howdy nurse apparently liked you. Well done, Olaf. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was crazy. Yeah. Oh my but, uh, gosh. And, and 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 I was flying, I wasn't flying well. I'll be the first one to admit it. I mean, I was a lot of suck it up, you know. I I uh, I was flying. People used to laugh because I would be like so like freaked out, you know. And this is before like debriefings and all that stuff, you know, it was it was a matter of suck it up and fly on. So yeah. I survived all that. And then I went from there to Kodiak, a great move, but actually I, not one time in Kodiak was I like, like I was in mobile just because, you know, in the, I was in the 60 primarily, you know, and right. everything else. So whereas the 65, I was after that, I was had an issue with, but. Is that why you sent me in all the 65 training fights? Huh? Is that why you sent me in all the 65 training fights? 65 training fight. Quinn, Quinn, go get on it. I'm not yep, going. That's exactly right. <laughs> the rank comes you with know, its pleasures. You know, you know, uh, come. <laughs> the, only, the only time I think we suck, I had to really suck it up is when they started that Alcat thing. And George and I had decided that if we were going to tell you guys that you had to go out there on the ship for these deployments, we had to lead the charge. So if you remember, George and I went out first. Yep. And uh, that's where I met, unfortunately, rest his soul, Andy Wishmeyer, who who passed away in the uh, the the flight in uh, Hawaii. So, but he was a great guy. Yeah, yeah. You ever? I mean, not not to get on some weird morbid talk, but do you ever like look, assess like all the people that you've met in your career now, and kind of like, like they're they're passed on, they're passed on, they're passed on. Like, and maybe it's my age or whatever, but I, I know a lot of people that have in our, in our, around the aviation and around like, you know, pilots and flight mix and a lot of swimmers that have unfortunately passed on. Yes. Uh, and there, you know, that's one of those weird, weird discussions that, that, uh, we don't usually have. It's, it's kind of funny. I know. And I, 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 think, I, I think it is something. Yeah. And you know, every time I go flying, I think about it. Um, you know, I, I, I don't ever want to be the statistics, you know, like there are so many no, aviators out there that have retired and gone on to live happy lives after a full career of aviation. Um, Absolutely. But you hear so many stories and, and every one of us have friends that something has happened. Somebody has passed away. Yeah. Plane crash, you know, whatever incident that happened. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. So I, I, it's just, yeah, it's, 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 it's a sad, it's a sad telling thing. I, I don't know if it's the nature of the beast, you know, and the personality or what it is. Anyways, I, sorry, I got off track. That's, no. I was just wondering that about you. Actually, that's a, it's a great topic of discussion because one of the things for me personally, like I said, I mean, every time I get in the aircraft, I, I engage, I try to be, um, I try to be a good crew member and, you know, going yeah, all the way back to the beginning of my aviation career. It's, that's what was instilled that, into me from you guys. And I still do yeah. that to this day. I mean, I watched PE when, or Pat Estrada, he would get in the aircraft right on the ground. He would go through all his exit techniques and his escape routes. And yep. um, I, I do that as well. And every time I get in and we take off, the first thing I think of is which way am I getting out of this thing? You know, and it, it's not yep. to And where's plan. my secondary? Exactly. Um, you know, if I, if I hear too much quiet up front, I'll say, Hey, what are you guys doing? You know, nobody's talking. Oh, they're listening to some radio where they're, you know, they got me isolated. Nope. Now but we're still, yeah. it, makes, it makes you wonder. Well, and, and that's um, one of the things. Do you remember Gene Rush? The pilot, oh, Gene Rush? very well. Very well. He, he was, he was probably the absolute master of calming a crew down because he, his, his octave never changed no matter what happened. And, yeah. and, and he, he, you could really tell. I've been in, I've been in situations in, um, and I'm sure you have too, where the, you could tell shit was about to get real. Cause just by the way, the pilots were talking, you yeah. know, and, and 
then you like you had other things and, and like you knew shit was going down but it was under control you know what i'm saying like like gene rush was great about that He's just like, yeah, everything's cool. I got it. You know, just, and you're like, oh, all right. You know, <laughs> that good. totally I'm sounded good. like him too. <laughs> Gene, Gene's here. I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, I mean, it, it's, I, I remember this one, this one, and it wasn't even like a big star case or anything, but it was just, it was just this one pilot who I knew very well in Corpus. And, uh, and there was a junior pilot who just, I mean, very boot, very boot. And we were in the goo and we were running out of, uh, uh fuel in the 65 and you know that the aes used to ca- you know calibrate that so you always kind of wonder like dude did they calibrate that right you know you don't know if, is it 10 pounds off 10 pounds on you know but uh all i remember is at one point you know i was i was confident in the pilot's ability but at one point the the junior pilot was asking the, the aircraft commander he was like hey you know do you want me to do this do you want me to do this do you want me to do this and they the aircraft commander who was not a emotional guy at all just came unglued and goes, all I want you to fucking do is aviate and navigate. And at that point, my pucker factor went to like 20. I was like, oh, we are, we are, yeah, this is getting scary now. Yeah. And just, and then like you, you take that and you take like Gene Rush going, yeah, everything's good. I got it. Yeah. Everything's fine. You're like, yeah. all right, I'm good. I mean, yeah. it's, seriously, it's, it, it's definitely one of those things. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Some of the pilots that I flew with in Kodiak, uh, all, Russ Zulik was another one. Ah, oh, I got this. Another one. Great. Right? You know, uh, Brian guy. Washburn, another one. Oh. Like, ah, oh, I got this. <laughs> yeah. And, like, you know, and, and those guys were great. And they, they were. Uh, Andy Delgado is another yeah, one. Great, yeah. Great, great. Those are the ones that stand on my mind. I mean, I know there was a lot of other ones, but like you, you just named off like a top, like Zulik, man. He kept you busy. Like you were doing fuel burn rates and you were right. doing this and you were doing that. And, but holy macaroni and cheese, you were a, uh, you know, you, you entrusted, you knew he, he was, he was there. And, and just like with Gene Rush and, and Brian, Wash, Brian Washburn one time, because one of the things, one of the habits I got into with the 60, you know, on your CDU page, I'd always have um, not just the position page, but I always have the uh, altitude because of my crash. I'm, you know, I don't want to sit there and like have them like going into a slow descent and not anybody know about it. So I'd always like watch it. <laughs> I remember one time it was, it was one of George, it was actually, it was actually Brian and Andy Delgado's last helo flight. And uh, uh, we were flying to Homer or something with George. That was I. you, George. I I remember that flight. You remember that? I, I do, because you guys all took off with all the, the uh, I, I don't know if I can say this. The growlers. Again, anyway. Yes, you took all the growlers and you were getting, yeah, we took oh, you were filling up with beer and uh, everybody had their orders in. Oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Before the, you guys came back into the shop to debrief that flight, and all you were doing was laughing for like an hour. <laughs> oh my god! The uh, but he uh, Brian, I, like I said, I had I had the CDU up, I had the uh, the descending, and he was probably he maybe the, the the helo came down probably like twenty feet or something. I'm like, you know, pilot aft, you know, just let you know you're descending. And all I heard Brian goes, "Let me have the controls." And like he said that to, to Andy Delgado, and all he said, he just dumped the collective. He goes, now I'm descending. <laughs> oh, gotcha, I gotcha. But it was one of those things, like, I knew he had control. It, it wasn't like a scary thing. It was just, I knew, you know, it was just funny as hell. Those guys were great. Those oh, guys were great. that's so funny. I mean, and, and, that, and that goes with the Camelot thing, too. I mean, it wasn't just with the swimmer shop. I mean, even our command. Do you remember Captain Nelson coming in oh. and working out with us? Oh, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was it, awesome. That, that whole, that whole, that whole thing was just, it, it, yeah, all the stars were aligned in every which way you could imagine. Greatest pilots, greatest command, greatest swimmers. So it was, it was fun. We had a good time for sure. It was. <laughs> I, I feel truly blessed at the fact that I was given the opportunity to be with you guys as my first unit uh, as a swimmer. It was awesome. Well, thank you. I, so, wow. yeah. I, I, I still, I, I don't think it's one of those things like you always look back and I know you, it's, it, it goes with that, that passage. You can never go home. So you can never recreate that same mixture, but it was great to live it. You know what I'm saying? It was, yeah. it was just so, you know, and I'm glad, I'm glad. And I think even then we knew it was great because everyone enjoyed it. Everyone had a good time, you know, and everyone had, we, you know, we didn't, we didn't do a lot of BS stuff there. I mean, it was, you guys, you guys were all grown men. That's the way we treated you. You know, I didn't have to overlook your shoulders. You know what to do. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, yeah. it was, yeah. 
There was no Anyways. like big pranks on everybody. We had small pranks from here time to time, but for the most part, it was a very professional shop. So it was, it was fun. I had a good time. Well, there was, I mean, there were some pranks. There was, there was always pranks, but there was some pranks. Like uh, nothing got crazy out of control. Yeah, but it was, I mean, but everything. And the other thing about that was the, the, and you, and you saw it definitely in like our, our uh, Christmas parties and things like the, the camaraderie that we had was, I mean, bar none. It was, it was some of the best swimmer camaraderie that people, people try to attain that in their whole lives that they'll never have that. Right. And I think at that point, I mean, on a, I'll never forget. I mean, do you remember like the, the Kodiak hand signal because Tim McGee had lost his uh, uh-huh. his ring finger, and so that was our that was because I thought he was throwing gang signs at me at one yeah. point. Boom! So that be yeah, that's it. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was so funny. Yeah, and that was it. Was just a great time. Yeah. Tim McGee, that's another. I mean, Louis Barbone. There were so many, so many great swimmers there. Anyways, what else? What else? We're going uh, down memory lane. That's awesome. I, yeah. I'll tell you what, Uh, actually, um, let's start with this real quick, because this is kind of a funny story. And and I know it, uh, again, hmm. to pieces, but you and George left the swimmer rate to go warrant officer. Um, Oh, my God. And, uh, (laughs) you know, I'll never forgive Jorge as long as I live for talking into that. Anyways, go ahead. So what I remember specifically is you calling... uh, either the detailer or, and this is a conversation that you and I had much later, but you called somebody who was like, I will come back in as a second class. Just get me back into the swimmer race. Yep. <laughs> I, it was, it was master chief. It was master chief Scott Dyer. I called him up and I said, look, I'll come back as a third class. I'll come. I said, I'll, I'll still make it. Cause I broke very, you know, very well service wise. I was good on service wise. I was like, I'll, I'll make it back up. I said, just bring me back. Just bring me back. Put me back in, coach. Put me back in. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I'll be honest with you, Jason. Of all the things, out of everything in my life, that's probably one of the biggest mistakes I ever made was going was doing that. I, I wasn't made for that kind of that kind of field. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it was so funny. One of the very first things, you know, as you know, we, we're George and I went warrant officer. So we went to the what's called the end field. Um, <laughs> I'll never forget. I went to Seattle. And there was like an oil spill and like everybody was losing their, their minds. Right. Yeah. And I'll never forget the CEO at the time. Well, you know, Mr. LaBelle, isn't this exciting? I go, no, nobody's going to die. No, this is, I said, you could, you could wait a week and it'll still be here. I said, this is nothing. You could just take your time. I don't understand why everyone's rushing around. I, I just, I wasn't about it at all. I just did not like it. I didn't, it, ugh, I still hate it. That's okay. It's I don't funny. even like to admit I did it. <laughs> It's so, like prison sex. I, I don't like to admit it happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one of the things I remember, uh, like I got talking to Pat Estrada, PE, and uh, he was, uh-huh. he, so he had gone officer and then came back into the swimmer rate. But yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I, he was telling me, like, he called you up one day. He's like, man, I'm just having a tough time in the office. And, and you had told him, like, just hide around a corner, grab somebody in a cross chest carry, splash water on yourself and say, I'm a rescue swimmer. I'm here to help you, sir. <laughs> I was like, that is oh, awesome. Pat, another, he's a great man. Oh, he's a great man. I, so yeah, I, I, I do believe, I do believe that, uh, and I, and I cannot speak for this, the newer generation of swimmers. So I won't even pretend to, but I cannot believe that it would change that much. But I, I seriously believe that, that, uh, and I think Butch Fly said this one time that uh, rescue swimmers aren't made, they're found. Like there's yeah. a certain, there's a certain part of you that um, each one of us that, that makes us do what we do and, and willing to do the things that we do. And, and, you know, that kind of thing. I, I really believe that, you know, if, if they could find like the, the absolute, what, one of the, one of the greatest stories was uh, uh, going to the chief's Academy back in, the day which was a wednesday um was you had to take like this profile this personality profile test right yeah and uh i took and i didn't match with anybody else and then i remember george and another swimmer were in his class and he took and they two met the, both those guys matched up and i guess the lady at the time was like you know she was going through like what are you alpha bravo zebra whatever the hell the stupid codes were and they they never called out george and this other guys this other swimmers Coes and she goes, oh, you know, what are you guys? And he rattled it off. And she goes, you guys are swimmers, right? 
And, <laughs> and I'm like, why don't they just get the test at the recruitment office? Why don't they just do that? Wow. I mean, that would be the easiest thing. Because, yeah. Because we all have that demented, what I like to call a moral flexibility. Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. The moral flexibility. True. Oh, it's great. You have to, though. You have, you have to be able to sit there and, and because you, I mean, a lot of times you choose life or death and you choose triage and you choose all these things and you have to be able to process that on a daily basis, yeah. you know, and, and you're on a constant, one of the things, one of the things, and I, and I am not belittling any other service member or anything else, but you know, you talk about like uh, combat veterans, combat veterans go deploy. And I have many, many of my friends are, and they'll deploy for a month or a, a month. They'll deploy for like 12 months. Yep. right they'll do a tour over there and then i go i did that for 20 years every every like fourth day or every sixth day you're on that hook all the time right and that that adrenaline you know and and, and like you talk to the comic vets a lot of times it's it's not the i mean it is it's it's the it's the boredom to sheer panic that fluctuation in your emotions and your adrenaline and that's what we that's what we had to live with all the time yeah you know yeah and, and i and and i like I said, I think there's something in our psyche that makes us like that. Just a little different. <laughs> I'm okay with it. Just a little bit. You have to. Yeah. Be. Yeah. We're not right. And, and I, I don't, I, I agree with you. I don't want to take away from any other service, any other uh, elite forces, because they do see some crazy yeah. stuff and they go through some uh, crazy events of their own. You know, I, I work with a pararescue guy here and some of his stories, I'm like, mm -hmm. are you kidding? You know, bullets yeah. flying past him. And, and he's like, yeah, that was. Yep. That's nothing. And I'm like, that was nothing. That you was amazing. He's like, nah, dude. No. <laughs> I, I had that happen when I was 15. Right. Come, on, boy. <laughs> Come on, Compton. What? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, I got shot out when I was 15 over a super girl. But uh the, Oh my uh, um, god. What? Shot at at 50 because of a girl. Yeah. Dude. Yeah. Gosh, women. I'm just kidding, baby. I love you. I know. <laughs> I, I love them yeah the uh the servicing it, it everybody has their own unique function and that's why like when i was in like when i was in the a second and and you know and you hear somebody talk about the army oh you know, which which is better the the green berets or the rangers or who's better that you know the seals or this and you go it's like comparing apples and oranges yeah because they're totally different missions you wouldn't send a navy seal into you know, the far desert where there's no water, you know, you wouldn't send, uh, you know, these, these other missions that, that don't, everybody has their own application. We yeah. have our own application. The only thing I wish that the Coast Guard would have done was um, in the, in the, in, in the initial interim. And this is, this is my little ego playing up is, is, you know, made us, made us into the elite that, because everyone plays it down, you know, every, yeah. And, and Steve, Steve Bober used to tell me that he's like, you know, you're not a unique snowflake. You know, you, you're just, you know, you're just part of the crew. And I totally get that because you don't want that separation, but yet none of the other crew had to go what we go through. And none nope. of the other crew does what we do. So. So something was said to me uh, by Dave Beecham and, and I still resonates with me even to today. And that is that, uh, you know, anybody can be a pilot. Anybody can go officer, but not anybody can be a swimmer. That's right. And, and it's the a path fact. is wide, and, but the gate is narrow. Yeah. And I don't, again, I'm not taking away from anybody that's an officer, a pilot, a, or no. anything else, but there is a 60% dropout rate for the rescue swimmer program. There is only yeah. 1,020 of us since 1985. Not anybody. How, how many are, how many are, how many are, how many are like, is it, because I know they've shut down some air stations and I know, because you probably got a better handle on this. How many um, active rescue swimmers are, are in service right now? I know it used to be like 300. Yeah, it's like 300, 350. It's, it's, not, it's okay. not that many. Let's call it 300 because no. that's about the average. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. I, I just, and, that, and that's a small little club. Yeah. It's a very small little club that, that some people belong to. So, yeah. and it's cool. I mean, it's cool if you can make it. It is cool if you can make it. <laughs> and then, and then and even more, if you can be a Kodiak rescue swimmer, that's even a smaller club. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> oh my gosh.
<laughs> so yeah, so that's what I've been doing. Uh, um, I'm glad you're doing this podcast. I'm really, I'm stoked for you, man. I think this is oh, a great, thank you. this yeah. is a great avenue. This is, um, it's it's definitely overdue, and I and I like the way you, uh, you didn't keep it. I mean, you have a special place in your heart, obviously, for Coast Guard rescue swimmers, but you've also branched off to other, you know, uh, rescue swimmers because I think that's another thing that we have to recognize that you know, there's 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 a lot out there. There there's are a lot of people doing some good. Yeah, uh, there there is some really cool stuff around this world, and to hear what people are doing is amazing. So uh, thank you. I, I'm glad I can be the platform for everybody yeah, to, to be awesome. able to come on. So, but yeah, my, my yeah. heart, my heart is with the Coast Guard swimmers. Come on. I know it's true, <laughs> but you've earned that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I chalked that one up. And I, I keep that one close to my heart. Yeah. I earned it. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you come up here, we'll tattoo a Kodiak rescue swimmer patch on you. Whoa, whoa, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm still an ink virgin, okay? So I gotta, I'm not sure I'm there really? yet. Yes, nothing. Uh, I'm, I'm, apparently, I'm a dude, unicorn. I'm so, up now. <laughs> I'm so tattooed up now. I got, um, I got a dead koi fish and a live koi fish on my chest, you know, swimming. And yep. George was one time, he was talking to me. He goes, he goes, man, you know how swimmers are. He goes, we're just either sink or swim. So now I got that tattooed across my chest, right, right above the the koi fish. And he's like, <laughs> George, George being George, like, dude, I'm not gonna say anything to you. You keep, on, you know, if I if you're gonna get quotes every time I talk to you, I'm tattooed on you. He's like, dude, you're you're a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Love George. Oh man, yeah, and actually, uh, we're gonna have a conversation, the the three of us here in the near future, which is very cool. Yeah, we're very excited about it. So awesome. Well, Olaf, I I won't keep you anymore. Uh, Buddy, thank you no, so much fine, yeah. for coming on. Like just telling the stories. Thank you for reaching out to me, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, you know, like I think I told thank you for all, all the compliments you gave me. I don't you know, know how much I deserve, but <laughs> a lot of them. A lot of them. Hey, you helped me in my yeah. career. So I, I can't thank you enough. Like you're a very good so. mentor. So I thank That's, you for that. That so. is awesome. That is awesome praise. Thank no. you. Absolutely. So until next time, my friends, uh, I'll, I'll see you soon and we'll go riding. I love it. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of here. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the real rescue podcast. Please take a minute to like subscribe and hit that share button. I'm pulling chocks and taking off. But before I go, if anyone out there has a rescue story they would be willing to share, I would be humbled and honored to have you on as a guest. Or if you have any questions about rescue or anything else we talk about here, send an email to jason at therealrescue.com. That's jason at T-H-E-R-E-A-L-R-E-S-Q.com. You can also check us out on our web pages, therealrescue.com, our Facebook page, and our Instagram page at The Real Rescue. Again, a special thank you to all of you standing on the watch today. Always remember, when that SAR alarm goes off, those in distress are praying for a miracle. They are going to get you. Until next time, fly safe and swim hard. <laughs>